Hey everyone, it's Colin, how's it going? The PS4 Pro and upcoming Project Scorpio look really cool, but what do they mean for the future of gaming consoles? So if you're not familiar with them, the PS4 Pro and Project Scorpio, which is an upcoming revision to the Xbox One, are kind of half steps in terms of the way that consoles normally evolve over the years. Now, of course, Sony also released recently the Slim PS4, which is a more traditional thing that they've done. And likewise, Microsoft came out with the Xbox One S, which is a smaller, physically smaller version of the Xbox One hardware. Now, both of those consoles pretty much do the same things as their original versions. The PS4 Slim, the smaller one, has pretty much the same specifications, the same capabilities as the original PS4, and pretty much the same thing with the Xbox One S. There are generally some small tweaks, but it's really just more cosmetic and or to save money during manufacturing of the consoles. But the PS4 Pro and upcoming Project Scorpio represent a major change in that, yes, they're similar to the consoles that they're based off of, the PS4 and the Xbox One. But what's different is that they're actually more powerful versions of it. In terms of the PS4 Pro, they're claiming that it'll be able to handle 4K gameplay. Now, based on the hardware specifications that we've been able to glean it's generally not all that sure that it'll really be able to do full 4K gameplay. We're pretty sure it'll do better resolution than 1080p, but it's not likely gonna be powerful enough to handle native 4K. But the point is, it's taking regular PS4 games and it's throwing more hardware at them. This is a major difference really from any other gaming generation that we've seen. In general, gaming generations have been locked in terms of how they work, what their capabilities are. They've been a fixed set of specifications or a fixed set of variables. And the reason why this is, there's, there's multiple reasons to it. But the most common reason, or at least the most logical one, is because it's easier and more consistent for developers to create games if the hardware is known across all of the people who are going to be playing that game. And this is something that I've actually talked about before in a video from quite a while back, in that if you've got a developer who's writing a game, it takes a lot of the guesswork out of developing that game if they know that every single person who's going to be playing that game is going to be doing so on a specific model of processor, on a specific model of video, if there's going to be a specific amount of RAM, a specific amount of storage, the, the capabilities of the hardware are universal across all the people playing that game. It makes it a lot easier because you don't have to accommodate for, well, what if people have a slower CPU? What if people have a faster CPU? What if they have different types of video cards? That sort of thing. Now, of course, it's not like it's the end of the world to write games like that. They do it all the time for platforms like Windows, where you've got this wide variety of, of, of hardware that can play these games. You know, many different models of CPUs and motherboards and graphics cards and that sort of thing. And the operating system generally tries to help with that, right? There's ActiveX, which acts as a layer between the game and the hardware to make it easier on developers. But still, Developers have to keep in mind as they're writing these games that some people are going to have really crappy video capabilities and some people are going to have the latest and greatest. And so oftentimes they've got to write in different, I guess, complexity levels to the game for what types of graphics should be shown. And you'll usually see this in the form of what resolution do you want to play the game at, what texture level do you want to see, do you want to see the best quality you can get out of the textures, do you want to scale it back to something a little more rudimentary and all that. They've got to accommodate for all those different scenarios. 
and it does add some complexity to the game and it can also mean that the game plays really well on some PCs but not so well on others. Traditionally this has not been a problem with game consoles because like I said they've been fixed. You know every, a developer who's writing a game for a PlayStation 3 knows that the PlayStation 3 is this thing right and that's the only hardware that a PS3 version of that game will ever play on. So it becomes a lot easier. They get a lot more consistency and they, get, they can also give the people playing the game a more guaranteed experience because everyone's PS3 performs the same way. Everyone really plays the game the same way. They get that same experience, the same level of quality. The big change now is that you're going to have people that have better PlayStation 4s and Xbox Ones than other people. Now, thankfully, it doesn't seem like they're changing the overall architecture of that platform too much, but it still does kind of segment users in that some people are getting a better experience than others. And this can add to some complexity to actually creating the games. And I think Sony has done a good job at least trying to reassure people that people who already own a PS4 aren't getting thrown into this camp of being like haves and have-nots where a new game that may come out won't necessarily support an original PS4. I think Sony knows, I think any decent company would know that it would be bad news for them to effectively cut off their existing customers like that, yet new consoles are still being labeled PS4, you know? And we've seen a little bit of that with the 3DS and the new 3DS. The new 3DS is a more powerful version of the 3DS. And Nintendo has come out with games that only work on the new 3DS because those games require more horsepower. And thankfully, those have been few and far between because I think Nintendo was smart enough to realize that if they try to come out with too many games like that, they're not really coming out with games for the 3DS. They're coming out with games for a successor to the 3DS. And by continuing to use the 3DS name, but only for games that work on the brand new versions of the hardware, is going to cause a lot of confusion and a lot of anger amongst people who buy those games that don't necessarily realize it won't work in their older hardware. So Sony's been doing a good job saying, look, all the new games coming out have to support all the different hardware versions of the PS4. And it really seems like the big difference between the experience, at least, on an original PS4 and a PS4 Pro is just going to be in resolution and overall video quality. It doesn't seem like there's going to be any difference to the gameplay itself, which is a much safer way to do it. And it really just signals to customers, if you want to get the better visual experience, all you got to do is pony up for a PS4 Pro. If you're fine with 1080p or whatever, just stick with the PS4, PS4 Slim, and you'll get the same overall gameplay. It's not like, you know, you're going to be, you know, having a different, you know, experience through the game. It's not like the game will take you on a different path than the people who ponied up money for the more expensive console. It also seems like that's going to be a very similar thing for Project Scorpio. Now, Project Scorpio, I think, only came out because the PS4, ever since it came out, has absolutely wiped the floor with the Xbox when it comes to sales. And it was actually the opposite way around with the previous console generation. In general, the Xbox 360 did better than the PS3. I think part of that also has to come down to the architecture of the consoles. The PS3 was a very different console in terms of how developers would write software for it than the Xbox 360. The PS3 was a very interesting beast hardware-wise where Sony came up with a lot of that hardware itself. And it was a very different thing. It didn't follow kind of the standard model for how hardware works at least when you think of it from the mindset of computer hardware. Where things have been very different is that the PS4 and Xbox One actually have more similarities than differences in that they're really both just PCs. 
They both run x86 based processors, both of them from AMD. They've got similar graphics chipsets in them. Although Sony's, I think they got kind of the better deal. Because in general, the PS4 does outperform the original Xbox One. But it lets software developers have an easier time writing those games. And we're really starting to see that come into play with this whole universal Windows platform notion where it's the same game between Xbox One and a PC running Windows 10, a proper PC. It's the same game. Because, for the most part, it's the same hardware. Microsoft hasn't released a whole lot of details about the operating system that the Xbox One runs on, but for the most part, it's just a tweaked version of Windows 10. It was originally Windows 8. So, where things have been headed is that it's not so much we've got a new console generation coming out with PS4 Pro and Project Scorpio, as it is, we've finally gotten to this point where gaming consoles are really just PCs for your living room. Case in point, the PS4 actually just runs a special version of FreeBSD, which is Unix, which is very similar to Linux. It's not like it's this, you know, OS that was written from the ground up. Again, that helps developers because it gives them something a little bit more familiar with which to work around when writing games. And I think that's why we've also seen a big rise in independent games. These indie games that are coming out, they, they're you know, hardly ever seeing physical releases. But they're coming out as these five $10 games and they can be pretty simple in nature, but they're really fun. Having the platforms be based on a more familiar architecture for software developers in general, I think really opens up the ability for, for developers to quickly produce games that otherwise wouldn't be worth writing because of the investment it would take into getting into, well, how do you write games for this particular piece of hardware, that sort of thing. We've also seen a lot of those small independent games go cross-platform, and they go cross-platform pretty quickly. Again, because it's a familiar platform to write on, and it's a very easy port going back and forth between the two. So this whole notion of we're going away from console generations really is a double-edged sword. I think it's a good thing in that it can spur innovation and it can make the companies generating these consoles be a bit more nimble. Project Scorpio, like I said, I think really came out because Microsoft felt like their backs were up against the wall with this generation. What could they do to try and regain some market share? Well, address some of the limitations in the Xbox One and perceived performance differences between it and the PS4 is one of those things that's easier for them to address than if they were to wait for another generation to come out, wait a few more years for that next generation. Because de developing a brand new game console from scratch like that is a lot more expensive. What they essentially did with the PS4 Pro and Project Scorpio is they just put in a new CPU and video card like you would with your computer at home. It's a simple way of putting it, I suppose, but that's effectively what they're doing. So those are the pros. The cons is that it kind of commoditizes this hardware and that you're more or less going to be seeing consoles going forward, at least from Sony and Microsoft, that are just continuing to be based on PC components. And I think in terms of their own engineering staff, it kind of gets them in a more lockdown mindset as to how the, the consoles work and what the gameplay experience is. Whereas Nintendo is farther away from Sony and Microsoft in terms of how the consoles work and what their, I guess, kind of mode of thought is than ever before. Nintendo is way, way out in the weeds now, especially with some of the rumors about NX. 
that it's really Sony and Microsoft are just competing against each other now. And, and, and Nintendo is like this third party, this kind of outlier where it's not so much a debate of, well, do I buy a PlayStation or an Xbox or a Nintendo as it is, do I buy a PlayStation or an Xbox? And then if the Nintendo is compelling enough, you buy that too. And that's really what we saw with Wii U. Wii U didn't really compete against PS4 and Xbox One. It's always been its own thing. The other downside, I think, to having this, this loss of console generations is it can add some confusion. Because at some point, they've got to deprecate old hardware, right? If, they never, if Sony and Microsoft never come out with a new version of a console ever again, at least in terms of a major generational jump, you know, a PlayStation 5, or whatever they call the next Xbox. Unless they do something like that, years down the road, they're eventually going to have to get to a point where they say, you know what? These games that are now coming out, they say they're for the PS4, but they don't work on the original PS4 hardware anymore because it's too slow. You know, a PS4, three years from now, is gonna have better hardware than even what the PS4 Pro has. And they've got to cut off the old hardware at some point because it's one, not worth developing for, and two, it may hold the games back. You know, if 4K becomes the standard three years from now and we've got hardware capable of supporting full 4K resolution, then why would a developer want to be able to write a game to handle 1080p anymore? You know, at lower texture quality and all that. So you get some, con you'll, you'll end up with some confusion there where a new PS4 game will only work on newer PS4 hardware and making sure that the people who own the original PS4 understand that their PS4 isn't the same as what's on the shelves right now can be challenging. Because remember, the vast majority of people who buy games and especially gaming hardware are not necessarily hardcore gamers. They're just regular people who occasionally play video games. The hardcore gamers, the people who collect, the people who have one of every console, that sort of thing, while those numbers are growing, they're still in the minority. So that's something that I think Sony and Microsoft really have to think about going forward. When do they come up with a cutoff like that and how do they handle that? They, they kind of, at some point, have to come up with a name change just to differentiate. These new games don't work on your old thing anymore. The other thing that I think it also will do is it'll cause another layer of confusion among the part of gamers, especially casual gamers, in that they're gonna see these refreshes starting to happen more frequently. You know, it used to be that we'd get six or seven years between console generations. And that's kind of an easy sell, you know, you buy a new console for 300, 400 bucks, you play it for seven years, and then the new one comes out, you get a pretty good return on investment. You know, if you amortize a console that expensive out over seven years, it doesn't really cost all that much per year to have it. But if Sony and Microsoft are starting to take this tack where it's like, you know what, every two or three years, we're gonna come out with a new hardware iteration. Some people are gonna be like, well, you know, should I buy that thing? They're gonna feel potentially like they're compelled to upgrade more frequently. Like they need to buy the new thing more often. It essentially turns video gaming hardware into more like how the smartphone market works, where you feel compelled to have to buy a new phone every two or three years. Because let's face it, not that many people are rocking smartphones that are six or seven years old either in terms of feature set or compatibility or support, not that many people have old smartphones like that. Yet, PS3s and Xbox 360s are still perfectly valid consoles because they stayed the same the entire way through their life. Of course, they were also a bit ahead of the curve. Like, yeah, I know the PS4 and the Xbox One have much better quality than the PS3 and the Xbox 360. But to, again, to a casual gamer, 
they may not see a huge difference when you just look at the games. And that's actually why I think the PS4 and the Xbox One got off to a bit of a rough start. In that people looked at the PS4 and they went, well, you know, yeah, it's nice and everything, but it doesn't really look that much better than my PS3. Why would I buy this? And only as time gone on and developers started to take advantage of, well, it's, you know, we're writing for commodity hardware now. We can take advantage of what we know for writing for PCs. Have we really started to see the PS4 and the Xbox One kind of become the by default console for this generation if you're gonna buy a game. It seemed like for a while there, you really had a choice. Well, do I buy the PS3 version or the PS4 version? I'm not gonna get a huge difference between the two. Now it's more, you know, the PS3 and the Xbox 360 are finally getting left behind. This current console generation is what's next. But that gets cloudy with this whole we're going to change the hardware every few years, but it's not really going to be that much of a change. But you might want to buy one anyway. Why? Lots of confusion there. So what I'm curious about are, of course, your thoughts. What do you think about the PS4 Pro? What do you think about Project Scorpio? Are they worth it? Should they have held off and just waited another three years and dropped a new console generation? or going to this rolling model where we really have no firm differentiation between major versions of console, is that the better way to go? I'm curious as to what you think. Are you gonna buy a PS4? Are you gonna buy a Project Scorpio? Or are the existing consoles good enough? Is 1080p good enough for you, at least at this point? Be sure to leave your comments down below this video. I'm also, of course, always curious if you've got suggestions for future topics please leave those comments down below as well. They all go on a list and I review them periodically. I may not get to it right away, but I like to know what you want me to talk about, what you're interested in. So if you're watching this on YouTube, if you uh, like the video, I would appreciate a thumbs up as always. And if you haven't yet, please subscribe. That helps me out quite a bit. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at thisdoesnotcom. And as always, Thanks for watching.